We need to know so much to plan the care for cardiac patients, and the stethoscope tells us so little. If only there were a way to learn more about what's going on in the heart. The heart emits tiny electrical signals as it beats. Could we perhaps detect them somehow and study them? That's going to be a challenge. The signals are measured in microvolts, and the output impedance of the patient's body is huge. We're going to need some clever circuitry. Hi, I'm Kevin. Welcome to my cave. Often in analog circuits, we need to deal with tiny input signals that often come from sources with very high output impedance. So we need similarly high input impedance for our circuits. Patient monitors are only one example. In music, sources like microphones, guitar pickups, phono cartridges, and tape heads all emit tiny voltages or currents. In other fields, so do photodetectors, strain gauges, and a whole raft of other things that interface with the physical world. They often cannot be tied to circuit ground, so we have to deal with possibly large signals that are coupled into our input lines. The local AM broadcast station, the hash from a nearby computer, the static from lightning near and far, and the impulsive noise from the floor polisher in the next room all have a way of turning up. The basic circuit that we use to deal with that is a two-transistor circuit called a differential pair. Let's take a look at how these work. Before we continue, I ask you to indulge me for a brief public service announcement. Your support for this channel has been really outstanding, and the channel has grown to where I'm seeing a small amount of revenue from YouTube. I love you all. You've been wonderful. And so I know you'll respond to the call to take care of one another that I put at the end of every video. I've decided that the whole of my January 2025 payment from YouTube will go to the Against Malaria Foundation. The Foundation's sole mission is to provide insecticidal nets to people living in places where malaria is endemic. Its performance is outstanding among the charities that I've examined in terms of lives saved per dollar spent, to say nothing of the humanitarian and economic benefits of reducing disease burden in the tropical nations of the world. If you are inclined to fight bugs in more places than our circuits, I hope you'll join me in supporting this charity. There should be an affiliate link down there, or up there, or in any case somewhere nearby. Thank you so much for your generosity. And back to the video. We'll start with a rough idea that we need to transform the impedance of one of our inputs from a very high value to a much lower one. We already know of a circuit that transforms a high impedance to a low one, the emitter follower. So let's take one of our inputs and let it feed an emitter follower. The output of this follower is going to be the input voltage, offset by one diode drop. Next, we'll connect the second input to the base of a common emitter amplifier. I've drawn the amplifier backwards, with its input at the right, because that's the convention in this circuit to emphasize its symmetry. The clever trick is that the amplifier will use the follower's voltage rather than ground as its reference. So the output of the amplifier will be some gain times the difference of the second input signal and the first, plus some offset voltage. I'm not going to calculate the gain and offset yet, because this explanation is oversimplified and the biasing is all wrong. But we've got the basic circuit topology here. Let's fix it up and analyze it. I'll stick a resistor on the emitter at the output amplifier, because we know we need an emitter resistor for gain stability. I'll also put an equal resistor on the emitter at the input follower, for the sake of symmetry. Because I want to demo this circuit, I'll also fill in some concrete component values now. This configuration is called a long-tailed pair. Back in the day, if resistors were very different in value, it was usual in schematics to show the larger ones with more zigzags. Apparently, the long resistor hanging off the bottom reminded somebody of a widow bird on its perch, dangling its ridiculously long tail below it. As with all our transistor circuits, we'll start by choosing a quiescent point. I'm going to assume that at the quiescent point, both inputs are grounded. That will place both emitters at a diode drop below ground. I'm going to try for a quarter milliamp of quiescent current in each transistor. As usual for this calculation, I'm going to ignore the base currents. Our rule of thumb 
We'll make the intrinsic emitter resistance 100 ohms at room temperature. I'll make the emitter resistors three times that. They'll drop about 75 millivolts. The tail resistor needs to drop about 11.3 volts while carrying the current from both emitters. 11.3 volts divided by half a milliamp is 22.6 kilo ohms. 22K is the nearest standard 5% value. Now we have to choose the quiescent voltage at the output. We want to center it roughly in the range that the output voltage can take. In this configuration, the output can't fall below ground, so we choose half the positive supply voltage as the quiescent point. The collector resistor will have to drop those 6 volts while carrying the quarter milliamp quiescent current, so 24K is the value we'll put in. OK, now let's figure out what gain we get from this circuit. Remember that we are interested in amplifying differential signals. Let's apply one while keeping the common signal at ground. We'll put half the voltage at one terminal and negative half the voltage at the other. I want you to satisfy yourself that as long as the differential voltage is less than a diode drop, the voltage at the center node won't change appreciably. It'll still be a little more than a diode drop below ground. Go ahead and pause the video until you're sure you've got that point. I'll still be here when you get back. Since we're holding the emitter at a constant voltage, we have a common emitter amplifier here, as advertised. We know that the small signal gain of a common emitter amplifier is the ratio of the collector resistor to the emitter resistance, including the intrinsic resistance. With these values, we expect a small signal gain of 30. Now let's look at what happens to a common mode signal. We'll apply the same voltage to both inputs, rather than pushing one up and the other down. We would get the same result if we split the tail resistor into two parallel resistors of twice the value. There's no current in the wire joining them, because the emitter currents of the two transistors are equal. We can snip that wire and not change the behavior for a common mode signal. Now the right-hand side of the circuit looks once again like a common emitter amplifier. We can apply the gain equation again to find that the gain for a common mode signal is negative 0.54. Since our objective was to pull a small difference signal out of a lot of noise that was common to both inputs, we can now talk about a key figure of merit, the common mode rejection ratio. It's simply the absolute value of the differential mode gain divided by the common mode gain. For this circuit, that's 30 divided by 0.54 or 55.6. It's more usual to express it in decibels, and this circuit has a common mode rejection of just under 35 decibels. Let's see this circuit in action, and see how close we came in our calculations. But before we head off to the cave, I need to explain how I'm going to get both input voltages into the circuit. My function generator has two outputs that can be controlled separately, so I can generate common mode and differential signals. I can give them different frequencies and waveforms so that I can tell them apart. The problem is that they share a common ground connection. I can't float one of them with respect to the other. That means I have to think of a way to add them. I started thinking in terms of quickly hacking up another oscillator and making it battery powered so it could ride on top of the function generator, or of using an op-amp adder but I'm a caveman and decided to go with a primitive method going all the way back to vacuum tubes. You see, when I was looking at my parts storage, I happened on a power transformer designed to take the 120 volt US mains and step it down to 6.3 volts with a center tap. That would make its turns ratio about 20 to 1. It's not designed to be used as a signal transformer, but why not give it a try? If I connect the differential mode signal to the primary, I should see a signal of about a twentieth the amplitude at the secondary. Then I can run the common mode signal into the center tap, which will lift both ends of the secondary by the same amount. The common mode signal will be twenty times the amplitude of the differential signal for the same setting on the function generator. But that's all right. We're looking for our circuit to be able to handle weak differential mode signals. Here's what that sketchy setup looks like on the bench. 
I have the differential mode signal running to the transformer primary through the black wires. The common mode signal go through the resistor at the left edge of the breadboard into the transformer center tap, the green and yellow wire. The two green wires from the transformer secondary are going to the two inputs of the circuit. I'm using a dual transistor because later on it will be important to have the two transistors matched and at the same temperature. Two of the scope probes are looking at the bases of the two transistors, and the third is looking at the collector of the output transistor. When I turn on the differential signal by itself, both the inputs, on the yellow and aqua traces, are showing a peak-to-peak -peak voltage of 150 millivolts or so. They are almost perfectly mirrors of one another, so the peak-to-peak -peak differential range is about 300 millivolts. The output on the purple trace has a peak-to-peak -peak range of just under 9 volts. Dividing that by 300 millivolts confirms our calculation that the differential gain should be about 30. When I turn on the common mode signal instead, both inputs are showing a peak-to-peak -peak range of just a volt. The aqua one is almost perfectly overlaying the yellow one. The lower purple trace is showing a peak-to-peak -peak range of about 530 millivolts, and it's 180 degrees out of phase with the input. That's a gain of negative 0.53, very close to what we calculated. When I combine the two signals, we can see how the differential pair is knocking down the common mode signal. The inputs are dominated by the fast sine wave, although you can see how the differential mode signal sometimes raises one above the other. The output shows mostly the slow triangle wave, although a little bit of the fast sine wave is leaking through. This performance is pretty shabby. Differential gain of 30 and common mode rejection of 35 decibels will not be nearly enough for some of what we have in mind. We can always get more gain with additional stages downstream, but we really have to clean up that common mode signal. Next time we'll get to work on that. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, stay curious, and take care of one another. Bye.